for the invitation, Enrique. I really want to thank um, uh, Master Lab for really allowing me to give this um, seminar series. I think it's a, it's a very important topic for the chemist and for the structural elucidation of small molecules. The talk that I'm going to give today that I, we decided to, to, to call RDC is the trilogy episode one. Uh, RDC theory alignment media measurements. So the idea here is to set up the basis for uh, the other webinars. The other webinars will be on data analysis and examples. And the last one will be more on the practical point. So we will um, talk about how to prepare gels, how to, to wash them, and how, how to set up to really get good measurement. So let's go to the topic. So we're going to start on with the theory. So, um, well, uh, this is all we can do with NMR. So I think that if you don't know this, probably you are in the wrong webinar. Um, is, um, we know all the information and how powerful is NMR. <coughs> In, uh, for the chemist in general, so we can determine chemical environments, we can see individual atoms in a molecule, we can get through bond connectivities. This is very important because we can um, determine molecular constitution, how the atoms are connected. Then we can do through space connectivities and then we can determine relative configuration and using dynamic properties and we can evaluate internal motion and translational diffusion, for example, with DOSI diffusion order spectroscopy. Um, um, I, I always like to, to show this picture, probably if many of you probably been in, 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 in one of my talks. Um, this picture is going to be in a, in a book chapter that is coming soon, soon. I hope so, in the, R, R, in the Royal Society of Chemistry, in a book. Um, but here is when we when we determine um, the the relative configuration by NMR. Normally, for example, you want to determine the relative configuration between the center at carbon three and the center at carbon seventeen. Normally, what we do is we use a relay of correlations. You know, we can use J coupling, we can use NOE, and we can go from here to here easily. But uh, the maximum range of NOE for the small molecules is probably 4 to 5 Armstrong. Uh, it's 5 is a very generous number. And then imagine that we, we divide these two centers with a, a linker that is flat, is non magnetic, and then we end up in a situation like this one. And if we want to correlate these two centers, they are far apart. They are 7.5 Armstrong, so we cannot do it by NMR. So here is when conventional NMR and using a set of local correlations, you know, do no longer work. So the idea is how we solve this problem of determining the relative configuration of centers that are remotely located. Well, as I said, magnetic resonance has limitations. Uh, here is the limitation of, of um, the nuclear overhauser effect. So J couplings are always restricted to the local environment. We can distinguish negative from positive dihedral angles. Otherwise, we would we would be able to do uh, absolute configuration by NMR. So so what we can say at this point is that parameters like this in conventional NMR provide structural information of local character. Um, if um, if we want to solve the problem and go beyond local interaction, I think that we should. More, more probably talk about getting a, a, a new NMR parameters that allow us. So what is a dipole-dipole interaction? A dipole-dipole interaction is an interaction, for example, that it can probably describe as an interaction between magnets, like the one you see here. And, and this interaction depends, as uh, you can see, on the angle of these two magnets and the distance using this uh, equation. Uh, and then they can be represented in, uh, uh, by a second Legendre polynomial. Um, and please keep in mind this and, and then remember this because here, you know, this is, you, you can represent this function in 3D space with lobules, lobule positive, lobule negative, lobule for this function. And then, and then if you, uh, you rotate around this with, a, you know, a unit, a vector that connect the two magnets, for example, you know, there is a point in which 
this is uh, the, 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 the angle is 54.7 and this value probably maybe uh, here is zero. Uh, but the dipolar coupling in NMR is the interaction between two uh, spins, I and J, and the dipolar coupling between I and J, uh, as it is represented here in this formula, depends on the distance between them, you know, in inversely proportion to the, the third power, and depends on the cosine square of theta, that is this angle, that is the angle between the internuclear vector and the magnetic field. So this is the equation for static molecules. And there is this constant, and in this constant you can see that also the dipolar coupling also depends on the product of the gyromagnetic um, constant. So probably the, the, the largest one would be proton, you go because proton, proton, so that will be the larger value, and then you can speculate that it will be small if you have proton carbon or proton nitrogen or even carbon carbon or nitrogen nitrogen. And here is an um, example in which you can see that the maximum value, you know, for the cosine square of theta is one. So for angles zero or pi, and then I just calculated here the value of k or kappa, uh, and then for an NH bond that is parallel to the magnetic field, the, the Dij maximum is 21.7 kilohertz. But for, uh, oh, so sorry, this should be carbon-13, there is no carbon-15. Um, carbon-13 bond uh, for, an, for a distance of 109 Armstrong, so the Dij value is 46.6 kilohertz. Here, you know, it's a nice representation in 3D space where you can see that this, that is, this vector is parallel to the magnetic field will be a maximum value and for, for a carbon will be negative. And then there is a point in which we zero and there is a point in which will be the opposite sign and divided by two and as represented also here is a cap. And then if cosine square is 54.7, this is equal to one-third, and Dij is maximum, and this is what it is known, you know, in NMR by the magic angle. The magic angle is used by the um, solid-state people uh, in order to press to, to rotate and spin the samples and making the, the dipolar coupling disappear because in solid-state NMR, dipolar coupling, especially brought in the signal, and it's garbage, but it's not garbage for us. So here, is a representation of two spins, and then you can see that if, you, if, if your dipolar coupling is zero, you will have a singlet, or a, you may have a J, and then, and then, then you will have the, mind, uh, the dipolar, the, 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 um, the signal will be a split that will be minus D over two plus D over two, and if there is a J, then we will see a total splitting, that is J plus Dij. So it is important to have a J because since the dipolar coupling e has a sign and can be positive or negative, sometimes it's good to have a J. I know the J of the coupling because if the J is positive, then you can and then you can determine, as we will see later, we can determine the value of D as in experiments where we can measure J and then we can measure T, which is J plus D. Um, well. The D provides extremely powerful structure information, as, and this information is of non-local character due to its dependence with R and theta. So here, you know, we, we can see that since the dipolar coupling give us the, the, the relative orientation of the internuclear vectors, so this is very powerful because the equation do not encode for the distance between the vectors, but in, encodes, this is, you, this is very important concept. The, the dipolar coupling encodes for the relative angle of all those vectors respect to the magnetic field. That is why you need another way to know the relative distance in, in, in a molecule, for example, to have the constitution of the molecule. So a unique combination of dipolar coupled pair of spins can produce a unique set of dipolar couplings that in turn can lead to an, the unambiguous determination of the relative special orientation or arrangement of atom in the molecule. So what is this special arrangement? This special, this special arrangement reflects 
the constitution, the configuration, and the preferred conformation of the molecule. But keep in mind, it's all relative. Um, explaining the concept in this way, the use of dipolar clamping to the analysis of small molecules sounds very simple and straightforward. But remember, as I said, dipolar couplings are in the order of kilohertz. In solid state powders, all possible spatial orientations adopted by molecules lead to extremely broad NMR lines, making the extraction of individual dipolar couplings very difficult or nearly impossible. In solution, they average out due to isotropic molecular time and are not observable in the NMR spectrum. So let's see and let's analyze the dipolar couplings in isotropic solution. In a solution, as I said, they average out due to isotropic molecular tumbling, and they are not observable in the NMR spectrum, what we call the isotropic condition. The problem is that when, when we have a molecule in solution, DIJ, that is called the residual dipolar coupling, uh, dipolar coupling constant, now is, is represented by this equation. So where, where cosine squared of theta is no longer an angle. Uh, you know, uh, it's time dependent, and then and then this time dependence uh, of of the motion of this uh, internuclear vector can be represented as a probability distribution of this vector all over the three D space, and that can be represented and is and our disease can be easily understood if we talk about a probability tensor. So I will give you time to. Um, to write down this, the, this paper, Concept in Magnetic Resonance, by Kramer and, and, Colab and et al. So it uh, describes clearly, and what I'm going to talk about is, is nicely described here. So, so how, how we describe this in terms of the probability tensor? So as Kramer says in their paper is that what we can do is we can sit and fix our reference access uh, uh, with the magnetic field fixed in the laboratory and make the motions of this you know are time dependent or the other way is we can probably sit here in the in, in the molecule so and then we can see as we are in the molecule we can see the motion of, of B naught so there is a nice description in that paper in which what we can calculate is if we are in the molecule, let's imagine that we are sitting in the molecule like being in a, in a spaceship, okay? And then, and then we go into solution and then we have windows in X, Y, and Z. So what are the probability as we move and we tumble to see B naught in the different axes of our molecular axis? And then if the probability is the same in the three axes, well, we can represent this by this three times three, times three matrix. And, and this, this is what we call the probability tensor. And the, the sum of the probabilities is, are equal to one. So, but if the probabilities are equal, means that we have one third, one third, and one third of probability to, to see the magnetic field. So, so, so this is represented the distribution of the vector in solution over time. And then what we can say is that they are equally distributed. So, in, um, from, from this article, it can be easily uh, um, this, um, deducted here that we can represent this uh, cosine square theta in a tensorial form in which we have, in which this is equal to the R transpose. R is just the, this, this is just the coordinates of, of the internuclear vector. And, and then this is, this is just this product and then the probability tensor here in the center. Uh, and then we can describe this in a reduced form. Okay? And, and then Dij are equal to, to, to kappa. Uh, this is exactly the same equation, but where we explain this in terms of the, te of the, ten of the probability tensor. The problem with the probability tensor is that uh, it's easy to explain these uh, probabilities, but, but um, the, in the literature, they describe this in terms of the alignment tensor. But the alignment tensor is just the probability tensor minus one-third. So if we, 
replace this okay, here and then and then and then and then as you can see here and then we multiply this part that this part will be a and then we do all the math here as it follows then we can say that see r transpose a 10 the tensor and r you know is equal to cosine square but the average cosine square you know, as a function of time minus one third so look so if we if we look at the at the dipolar coupling equation here then we can see that we can replace this by this and then we end up with a tensorial equation of the dipolar coupling and what is the mean of this? The mean of this that no matter if the, if the molecule is static, the molecule is in solution, isotropic or anisotropic, this is the equation that describes the dipolar coupling uh, regardless of the motion regime of the molecule. Uh, in isotropic solution, as I told you, see, if P is one-third, 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 and then we subtract one, and then minus one-third, and the un unitary tensor, what we get is just two matrix that are one-third, 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 and this is zero. So the, 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 when, when the probabilities are the same, the alignment tensor is just zero. And then, if this is zero, Dij vanish in isotropic solution. Here we can explain the same concept, but just with the probability tensor. Look, if we put the probability tensor here, I put one third, one third, one third. So regardless of the value of and the orientation of R, when R can be see this, let's say this is this is uh, zero in x, zero in y, and and one in z. And then if, no no matter where is the orientation, the result if the probabilities are the same, the result is always going to be zero. So, what we want to do is we want to move, see, we want to move this away from one-third, 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 if we want to see a value that is different from zero. So, if we force molecules to adopt a minor degree of alignment in solution and no longer tumble isotropically, a measurable fraction of the dipolar coupling, what we want to see for organic chemistry is we want to see a degree of alignment or a fraction that is between 0 0.01 or 0 0.1 percent because this is also a very important concept. We want our molecules in solution to, to, to be moving isotropically for 99.9, 99.9.99 the percent of the time. So we always get isotropic motion and we got a very long T2 and then we got sharp lines and still we can measure the, the dipolar coupling. Um, so this fraction of the dipolar coupling is what it is called the residual dipolar coupling, but we can also call it the partially average dipolar coupling. Uh, the, so the, the liquid crystal researchers, they call it partially average dipolar coupling, and this name was given by Ad Bax when he started with dipolar coupling, because this term residual dipolar coupling is coming from solid state. Um, but we, the important part here is that RDCs maintain the same angular information as the original dipolar coupling. So we don't need to measure the full dipolar coupling. If we measure a fraction, this is enough to get the same structural information. So this information now is of non-local character. So if we can get all the dipolar couplings or residual dipolar coupling, we can determine the relative orientation of those vectors. So look how powerful is this. So the RDCs as I said, depends not only on the internuclear distance, but also on the angle of the internuclear vector with respect to the external magnetic field. Uh, and the most important part is that this is regardless of the distance between them. So two internuclear vectors, two CH bonds, can be separated by one Armstrong, six Armstrong, ten, fifty, hundred, you know, millions of Armstrong. They can be in two different planets. But as someone said, but if they are in the same NMR2, we can determine the relative orientation. So if we go back 
to a dipole recovery in an isotropic solution. So what is the idea here? So the idea here is that if we want to have an alignment tensor that is different from zero and we want to see a residual dipole recovery, we need to make P, X, P, Y, and P, C different. Okay. So, so if we want to, to make it different, so the one million dollar question here is how do we experimentally go from here to here? How do we go from equal probabilities and then we need to manipulate those probabilities to be just slightly off, you know, a one-third, one-third, one-third. So, well, you know, a, a way to do it is, oops, see, see, this is, this is, you know, this would be X and these X are in isotropic solution and these are X in solid state. Uh, of course, this is probably solid state and then that's what, not what we want. But what we want is to do this. So to do this is just, this is not different from the society in which we live. So we live in a very anisotropic society. So we don't move freely. You know, the cars, the cars have to go in streets. The, the, the streets are grids, and then we have to walk between walls at home, in buildings, in uh, in streets. So, 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 if we look at our probability tensor in 2D space, it's never one half and one half. So that we can do the same and how, the, the same holds. How how can we manipulate the motions? And the way to manipulate is, for example, you know create microscopic columns, for example, that it is done by helical polymers or what we call the LLC phases, or, you know, we can do a stretch polymers or we can use, uh, you know, a compressed polymer gels. And in all of these cases, uh, the, 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 the alignment tensor is different from zero. So in the only case in which it is zero and PX is equal to PY and is equal to PZ, in one, one third is when the molecules are moving moving isotropically. Well, so if we want to align small molecules, so how we manipulate these probabilities? Well, one way is, as I said, we can use a stretch of compressed polymer gels using different type of organic solvents, or we can use lyotropic liquid crystalline solution in organic solvents of helical polymers or homopolypeptides, and recently there are two very nice papers of using graphene oxide. Uh, and there is one paper in which uh, they use plain graphene oxide, and there is a recent paper in Angevante by uh, Professor Xian, Xin Xian Lei in Wenzhou, China. Uh, and this paper just been recently published with graphene oxides that are grafted. Um, so, I hope I, I didn't confuse you too much with all the mathematics, but I think that it is important. We will come back to this when we do data analysis. Uh, but now, now suppose that we have a molecule. The molecule is in an isotropic conditions. Uh, so how how we measure our disease? Well, the way to measure in our disease is um, to use uh, to use experiments and 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 which are the most common are disease in a small organic molecule? Well, the the most common ones are the one bond CH, and if you have, for example, a peptide or a cyclic peptide, is the one bond NH because they are easily measured. Uh, they are easily measured because they are large. And imagine in organic chemistry, if you can measure a couple experiment like a couple HSQC you know that the CH, the one bond CH J, uh, J coupling is in the order of 120 to 250 hertz. Well, I said 250, but that is when we have triple bonds. But if we don't have triple bonds, it's between 120 to 180. So, and then if we want to measure a dipolar coupling that is just a fraction, for example, let's say a fraction of 46 kilohertz, we can measure 46 curves easily, and then if they are positive or negative, they will add or subtract to the splitting. Uh, then, 
and it is possible to do two bond proton carbon and three bond proton carbon, but they are one order of magnitude because the distance is longer. And measuring them with the desired accuracy is very challenging. Uh, there is another, uh, oops, there is another uh, dipolar coupling that is the geminal proton proton that is less popular but can be measured. And one bond carbon carbon, I, I, I've seen probably three or four papers only in which they measure them because of the sensitivity, especially a natural abundance. Um, just, I just want to highlight that most, most of the problems that we solve here in our laboratory, and I see many people solving it, they use one bond proton carbon. And if you have enough one bond proton carbon, uh, you will be able to, to determine the relative orientation. So, um, as I said, uh, the the DCH values are relatively easy to measure, and we can use um, HSQCs coupled in F2 or coupled in F1. The RDCs add to the observed J coupling. So, well, as I mentioned before, we will see a total coupling that is J plus D. Um, a, and, and, and as I also mentioned, since the alignment, is, since we want to have a, a very weak alignment, degree of alignment, it, the, the, the one bond proton carbon is the easiest, and it's very easy and very fast. And I just would like to convince you that that is possible. For example, here, RDCs, here I, I show you the relative sizes. So for a 1DCH, if this is 1, for a distance of 1,1, one, one, so you can see that the proton-proton is 0.9, but then the proton-nitrogen is 0.5, and then the, the three bonds HH is uh, 0.3, and then the two bond CH is already one order of magnitude. So here is just an example eh, in which you can run an experiment, an HSQC, and in an HSQC you can see here the J's, and you can here see the J's plus D. And then eh, taking one experiment in an isotropic condition and another in, sorry, in isotropic condition and another in an isotropic condition, yeah, we can extract the, the values of the RDCs. Um, this is uh, this is a gel, and then you can see the signals here from the gel. This this is um, a picture that uh, that it was kindly provided to me by Professor Burkhard Lue. And the problem with the one bond um, F2 couple is the mismatching of the J because you always use a J of 145, 155 hertz, but then if there is a mismatching. In the regular HSQC, you have distortion of the phases. Uh, and the other problem that I will also want to highlight here is that when we use RDCs and we measure them in F2, we cannot avoid the presence of dipole-dipole-proton-proton interactions that broaden the signals. So if you have a very small molecule, it's fine, but you just go to a diterpene, triterpene, go to, a, you know, like cholesterol, steroid, and, and the situation gets worse. That's why I prefer, and I will show you later, the HSQC scapula is net one. But uh, Burkhard Lowy faced this problem with a simple removal of the antiphase component, and this is called the CLIP HSQC. And here you can see that, a, you know, delay of 100 hertz and delay of 150 hertz, and this is the best way. So probably the best way to measure RDCs in S2 is the CLIP HSQC, and recently they published the, the PIP HSQC, that is the perfect, the perfect in-phase HSQC. You can go, you can search in the literature, and you can ask for the PALS program to Theo Parella. Um, in my preference, you know, uh, is to do it in F1. And if we do it in F1, you know, we can measure you. Here we have the isotropic, we have the anisotropic here. Here is the J, and here is the J plus D, and here is the DCH. Um, also, we can measure CH2s, but the only, the only uh, problem, it's not a problem in fact, the only problem of measuring a CH2s is that because of the inept transfer, the center signal disappears. And as the center signal disappears, the only thing that you see is the sum of the coupling. You see the 1JCH plus the 1JCHB, and then you get the TCH plus the TCHB. But that's not a problem because you know the sum of the coupling is insensitive 
to a strong coupling effects of the two protons attached to the CH2. And the other advantage is that since you measure the sum, you can fit to the sum, as we will see in the next uh, webinar, and then you don't need to do diastereotopic protons assignment. Um, this experiment is very nice. It's already in the, in the Brooker Pulse uh, program uh, library. And, and also, if you change this angle in the past program by uh, 36, to make it 36 degrees, you can see an ecosy effect, and you can measure it as an extra bonus the, the, the 2JHH. Uh, here is a nice experiment. Look, this is the isotropic. Uh, this experiment is for strychnine. And, and then you can see here, see, here is a CH2, then nice. And then you can see the sum, here is a CH. Here are the aromatics that are folded, and also what we do is we do uh, we apply a J scaling factor. So if we fold it in a, if I, a factor of two, we gain in resolution a resolution a factor of two. But and then if we scale by a factor of four, is the equivalent of gaining resolution. So this is the equivalent of having an improvement in resolution of a factor of eight. And here is the isotropic in the gel. So as you can see, and you can see here. Very nice. It's very clean. Um, another experiment that I'm, gonna, I'm not going to describe because I need to see also the alignment media. But this is uh, this is a, probably for me is the best and most accurate experiment is to measure long range coupling proton carbon using this selective J scale HSQC that we published in 2011 with AdBax. Uh, so you, you, what you do is you do a selective excitation of a given proton, and then you read in the HSQC in, in, in F1, um, and then we use an scaling factor of 10, no, sorry, of 20, and then we can measure J couplings, for example, for this compound, and I will show you here, see? Here, we did a selective excitation of this proton, and we, and we see the coupling constant, the long range, and here is uh, you can see the isotropic, the anisotropic, and we can measure, you know, an RDC that is plus 1.14 hertz. The error here is about 0.3 hertz, but well, you won't believe it, but it's true. And I'm showing the result. And here, we can also determine the sign using, um, using an ECOSI effect. Depending on the ECOSI effect, we can get the sign. So you can go and look at the paper. I don't want to to, to um, spend, explain much time here. Um, and here are real RDCs. For example, this, for example, this here is the, the excitation of proton 5. And we see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 RDCs. You know, uh, the, the, blue are, the blue are uh, two bonds. The reds are three bonds. And then here you can see the RDCs here, measured, isotropic and anisotropic. Um, there is another experiment, PHSQC. In the PHSQC, using the uh, ECOS effect, you can also measure, um, in F2, you can measure the RDCs, and you can measure the proton-proton uh, coupling. Um, here is a nice um, spectrum, and when you can see the Js, you can see the total. Um, this, is, this paper was published by Burkhard Lloyd in Magnetic Magnetic Resonance. Um, honestly, uh, the experiment that I use more than 90% of the time is the, the, the F1 couple J bird, the J scale bird HSQC. And now we will move and then we will spend the last 10 minutes of this talk on uh, alignment media. So let's see the lyotropic liquid crystalline phases. Um, the first is, is <laughs> it's ironic, you know, because the first molecule to be aligned was a small molecule. It was benzene in 1963. And we had to wait until the early 2000 to see small molecules aligned in organic molecule, in organic, in organic solvent. But the problem is that the molecule was, was aligned in, in a liquid crystal, and the degree of alignment of a liquid crystal is 15 to 20%. And that's impossible, probably. It's not impossible, very difficult to measure. Uh, then in, in, the, in the late 90s, um, uh, PBLG was introduced, and the alignment is um, produced by these helical polymers that align with the magnetic field. 
and there is a very nice review article by Burkhard Loe, uh, dipolar couplings in strong oriented media. This, this, uh, this is how you see dipolar couplings in strong oriented media. So this is impossible. So then if we go to uh, PBLG and then we can do, this was measured in using just 1D carbon NMR couple. Uh, and um, hold on a second. I have a delay here on the transition. So probably this, uh, okay. Well, so um, the reality in 2003 was the, 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 the PBLG, but the PBLG, that is probably one of the reasons why people are skeptical to use uh, RDCs in organic molecules, because using PBLG, the alignment is very strong. And, and as you can see there, and of course, it was discovered that if you increase the molecular weight, the alignment is less, is less strong, but uh, still, it's still strong. And then there, there, there came other, other phases. Uh, here is just an, 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 a, a, you know, a chiral um, DMSO compatible LC phase by PBLG. I don't want, honestly, I don't use PBLG. I use it one time. The problem is because it's very difficult to, to, to prepare. Uh, if you really want to do it, probably you should contact uh, Professor Philippe Lesso in France or Christina Thiele in Germany. They are experts. They know how to make these samples. I don't. But um, then um, uh, Michel Regelin came with, um, with these uh, polyacetylenes in which the degree of alignment is small. So you can see here in the HSUC isotropic then you can see that the signals are, are much better. Uh, so, so the degree of alignment is, is, is less. Uh, but honestly, in my opinion, the best choice for alignment media are the strain, the strain gels. So this, his, this story came when Burkhard Lou in 2004 proposed to swell a gel in an NMR tube. The, the, the gel outside swells isotropically uh, this is just a gel, it's, it's 4 millimeter by 1 centimeter, but if you're swelling in the NMR tube, it will swell, it will touch the wall, and it will self-stretch. So the idea is that as you stretch the gel, you know, you manipulate the probabilities, and then you produce alignment. Uh, it is not a secret today that there is a bunch of different polymers, and if you stretch polymers or, uh, in, in different organic solvents, uh, also, Burkhard Louis has a nice paper in which he, in he stretched a, um, a gummy bear in, um, in a DMSO, and, and I think this is an Angevante paper. Um, so, we can scale the alignment uh, in gels. I don't want to not spend, spend much time. This, this is just a strong alignment. As I showed you, this is in PBLG. Uh, then this is a weak alignment in by bicells in biomolecular NMR, but in the case of gels, the alignment can be a scale, a scale by the diameter of the stick, the diameter of the NMR tube, the degree of cross-linking, the amount of radical, the polymerization temperature, the cell temperature. Um, the alignment is not dependent on the magnetic field. Um, but the other way, of scaling the, the, the alignment is stretching the gels in apparatus, like this apparatus proposed by Professor Kuchel, but this apparatus uses a silicon rubber, a silicon tube that is stretching the, in, in the NMR tube, and as you stretch it, you change the degree of alignment. This was silicon only water. Here you can see in the HSQC how the RDCs change, the total splitting as you stretch it. Then, you can measure slope of RDCs, and then you can measure them more accurately. The other proposal, also this one, are suitable for, uh, for water and DMSO. The other proposal is this apparatus by Burkhard Louis, in which the, he replaced the tubing with a polymer. Um, it's an elastomer perfluorinated, but I heard that this perfluorinated elastomer is damaged um, over time that you use it. Um, here, is an example when you choose the alignment, 
for example, this is an isotropic spectrum of cholesterol, and this is an, an spectrum of cholesterol, as I told you, when the quadrupolar splitting is 98.0 hertz. Um, so here you can compare the, the slices, isotropic and anisotropic here is almost impossible. So so the F2 sometimes is not not easy when you have too many protons. Um, if uh, I want to show you now something that we did on our group, I will take probably a couple more minutes. And so we we started preparing a PMMH, a PMMA gel that we use it stretch. Uh, here I want to show you that um, the quadrupolar coupling is a property that is also an isotropic, and then we use that quadrupolar coupling in order to follow the alignment. So, so if you want to see if your sample is aligned or if you know is is your media is an isotropic, you can measure it. You see your spectrum, and if you see a quadrupolar coupling. The quadrupolar coupling will give you a split. Um, this was the original method of the stretching. It took 20 to 30 days, and then diffusing the sample was two to three days. Uh, so we came up in 2010 with a method that is compressing the gels in uh, with a Shigemi piston. Here I have another slow transition, and then we came out with uh, an MR tube, a gel that is two millimeters in diameter and one inch or, or 25 millimeters long. So we swell in the NMR tube, and then as we swell it, we compress it, and then also since it behaves like a sponge, we can wash the monomer, we can get a clean gel, and then in this case, we use it four times by removing the sample. Uh, we, we were able to get slopes of our disease and to solve structure. Um, here, uh, here is the probability tensor of compressed versus stretch. And you can see the, 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 there is a, a, a switch in the signs, but this is not something that is not important right now. Then, uh, in order to make it more practical, because you you cannot put a Shigami tube, you know, put Teflon, run the experiment, and maybe the, 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 the Teflon or the electrical tape will loosen during the night, the degree of alignment will change, and then then it will screw your experiment. So what you don't want to do is, is that. So we designed this uh, device that it was now is commercialized uh, by uh, New Era Enterprise in which you can lock the degree of alignment and you can regulate it. And then here is a nice uh, quadrupolar capping of a PMMA gel. And, and then, of course, there is always something isotropic outside. And I want to show you something that we recently did is that we just published this this year is we have a gel now that is um, compatible with DMSO and because there is a difference in magnetic susceptibility outside and inside the gel when we compress it we can see both the isotropic and anisotropic signal and we can measure the RDCs in, and this one is the, the, the J scale very just you see in one shot so we can measure the RDC in, in a single experiment Imagine that instead of doing proton carbon RDCs, what you are doing here is proton nitrogen. You can a natural abundance. You can say 50% of the time. So here is the quadrupolar coupling on the MSO, 4 hertz. Here is the quadrupolar coupling on, of a chloroform gel. Here is the isotropic. Here is the anisotropic. So the only thing is that you have to know is that since the quadrupolar couplings depends on the electric field gradient of the molecule, you cannot compare quadrupolar coupling because these two gels have the same degree of alignment. Um, other than that, I think that um, I'm ready, I uh, will stop here, and I'm ready to answer uh, questions, if there are questions.